Captain Chelsea B. Sullenberger III. Sully. My Search for What Really Matters. In an age where headlines often spotlight failures and missteps, stories of true heroism stand out as beacons of hope. Sully chronicles the incredible tale of Captain Sully Sullenberger, whose unparalleled skill and calm in a crisis transformed a potential catastrophe into a testament to human resilience. Going beyond that fateful January day on the Hudson River, this blink sheds light on the dedication, preparation, and values that equipped him for the unforeseen. For anyone seeking inspiration amidst today's challenges, Sully's journey emphasizes the power of readiness and the spirit of perseverance. An Early Lesson in Self-Reliance Chelsea B. Sullenberger's father was a self-reliant individual, often taking on various tasks around the house, from carpentry to wiring and roofing. This sense of self-sufficiency was imparted to his children, teaching them not just to be independent, but also the value of precision and diligence. A particular lesson that left a mark was when Sullenberger mistakenly cut a piece of wood too short. His father's advice, measure twice, cut once, highlighted the importance of thoroughness and the irreversible nature of certain actions. From a young age, Sullenberger found satisfaction in seeing tangible results. Whether it was mowing the lawn or helping his father put shingles on the family home's roof, the pleasure derived from accomplishing tasks and marking progress was evident. Half-mowed lawns acted as clear indicators of work done and the amount remaining. This appreciation for measurable outcomes and the joy of completion is reflective of a goal-oriented mindset. Growing up in the 1960s, Sullenberger had clarity about his future aspirations. He envisioned a life in the military, followed by a career as a commercial pilot. Even as an earnest and serious young boy, he exhibited a heightened sense of self-awareness, recognizing both his strengths and imperfections. His writings from eighth grade provide a glimpse into his character. He acknowledged his good habits, like politeness, which he credited to his upbringing, and was candid about his shortcomings, like impatience and perfectionism. The feedback from his teacher, a simple affirmation that he was doing fine, was reflective of an era where sparse words of encouragement were the norm. This formative feedback and the societal expectations of the time shaped his adult disposition, regimented, self-demanding, and perfectionist, attributes he believed contributed to his proficiency as a pilot. Sullenberger's writings also shed light on his familial bonds. He expressed pride in his sister, despite occasional differences, and profound appreciation for his mother's ceaseless care. His father stood as a beacon of wisdom, guiding him, imparting lessons, and enabling him to learn from his errors. These relationships laid the foundation for his values and principles. Despite the imperfect nature of his home, with slanted floors and a lack of financial focus, Sullenberger cherished his upbringing. The house his grandfather built became more than just walls and roofs. It was a repository of memories, lessons, and familial love. He recognized the fortune of growing up in such an environment, nurtured by parents who, in their own unique ways, instilled invaluable life lessons. Military Life Sullenberger's journey at the Air Force Academy began on June 23, 1969 and it was nothing short of transformative. Coming from rural Texas, the diversity of cadets from various backgrounds was a fresh experience. While some hailed from influential families, the majority were regular individuals, or those from military backgrounds. Once their initial induction was done, which included haircuts symbolic of new beginnings, any previously held social distinctions faded away. Despite 1,406 entering the academy, only 844 graduated. The mesmerizing landscape of the West, especially the mountains of Colorado, left an indelible mark on Sullenberger. The modern architecture of the academy grounds stood as a testament to its recent establishment, with the first batch graduating only in 1959. 
Sullenberger knew that if he endured, he'd belong to the 15th graduating class. The rigorous training at the academy was challenging. From the moment Sullenberger donned his uniform, he was exposed to the tough, disorienting world of military training, which was quite a jolt from his comfortable upbringing. The objective of the intense hazing wasn't clear to him then, but with hindsight, he recognized its purpose. The Academy's goal was to instill values of duty, honor, and service before self by displacing the familiar and comfortable. These values had to be lived and not merely spoken, and the training ensured that the cadets internalized them. Responses like, yes, sir, no, sir, and no excuse, sir, became a reflex, underscoring the importance of responsibility and accountability. This intense training fostered a unique bond between Sullenberger and his classmates. The Air Force Academy's rigorous training played a vital role in Sullenberger's life. He discovered depths of resilience and determination he wasn't aware he possessed. The Academy also offered exciting opportunities, such as his exhilarating ride in a Lockheed T-33 military jet, which further cemented his passion for flying. During his time at the Academy, Sullenberger accumulated substantial flying experience. He became enamored with gliders, relishing the sensation of bird-like, engine-free flight. Flying gliders taught him the importance of leveraging the environment to stay airborne, particularly using thermal lifts for prolonged soaring. This love for flying saw him teaching other cadets to fly, eventually leading to him being named the Outstanding Cadet in Airmanship upon his graduation in 1973. The Air Force Academy wasn't just a military training ground for Sullenberger. It provided a holistic education emphasizing strong character, broad knowledge, and the capacity to contribute beyond military service. Though sometimes playfully dismissed by cadets, the high standards of the academy prepared them for challenges beyond its walls. New Beginnings In the late 1970s, now a committed Air Force officer, Sullenberger approached the end of his service commitment with a heavy heart. Passionate about flying fighters, he felt the best part of his military career was behind him. His love for flying was palpable, yet he recognized that to rise through the ranks, merely being an adept aviator wouldn't suffice. The expectation was for officers to transition into more administrative roles, requiring less flying and more desk work, briefings, and bureaucracy. In the military structure, appearances and networking held significant sway. The importance wasn't just on superficial attributes like haircuts or shiny shoes, but also on how one was perceived by superiors in the chain of command. While some acknowledged his flying expertise, Sullenberger wasn't naturally inclined to network or form political alliances, often believing he could advance based on his aviation merits alone. Additionally, the post-Vietnam War era brought financial challenges for the military. With budget cuts and rising fuel costs, pilots had fewer opportunities to fly. As flying was integral to a pilot's proficiency, especially with complex machinery like jet fighters, this posed a dilemma. The constraints made him evaluate his career decisions against a simple metric. How often would he get the chance to fly? His transition to civilian life commenced on February 13, 1980. His military farewell was marked with an emotional air-to-air -air combat training mission, after which he received a heartfelt goodbye from his squadron commander. With this, his fighter pilot journey came to an end. Entering the civilian world, he pursued a career as a commercial pilot, though the timing was less than ideal. The aftermath of federal deregulation led to turbulence in the airline industry, with many carriers facing financial strain or going under. Job opportunities for pilots were sparse, but he managed to secure a role at Pacific Southwest Airlines. Initially, he earned a modest income and began as a flight engineer on the Boeing 727. He joined the airline industry when remnants of its golden age lingered. 
flying was still a relatively novel experience for many, and the overall environment was more formal than what we see today. But Sullenberger's joy of being in the airline industry remained undiminished. Although he had to unlearn specific combat-related skills, he felt honored to be part of a revered profession. Contrary to his military experience, hard work and diligence didn't necessarily translate to faster promotions in the commercial sector. His rise to the position of captain was more a result of industry dynamics than personal recognition. Over nearly three decades in the profession, he transported about a million passengers. Despite the large number, few would recall him until a fateful day on Flight 1549. A Fateful Flight January 15, 2009 was a clear and cold day. Sullenberger's Airbus A320-214 prepared to take off from LaGuardia Airport. This specific plane, frequently utilized by U.S. commercial airlines, had amassed more than 16,000 flights and over 25,000 airborne hours. The flight took off smoothly, with 150 passengers and three flight attendants on board. Upon takeoff, communication was established with the departure controller. The crew navigated the initial stages of the flight efficiently, communicating their altitude, performing routine checks, and adjusting the aircraft's flaps for the ascent. The scenery of New York's skyline painted the backdrop, marking a seemingly uneventful beginning of the journey. But just shy of reaching 3,000 feet and around 95 seconds into the flight, the tranquility was shattered. A flock of Canada geese, sizable birds with substantial wingspans, rapidly approached the aircraft. The proximity was alarmingly close, allowing no window for evasive maneuvers. The subsequent collision resembled the fierceness of a hailstorm, with thuds echoing throughout the plane, predominantly impacting its nose, wings, and, critically, both engines. Sullenberger had experienced bird strikes before, but this incident bore no resemblance to past experiences. An immediate and profound loss of thrust from both engines indicated severe damage. The engines, no longer functioning, emitted disturbing vibrations and sounds, culminating in an unsettling silence. This acute dual-engine failure was an aviation nightmare. The situation escalated when a distinct odor of burning birds permeated the cabin, confirming the worst suspicions about the state of the engines. The realization dawned that both engines were incapacitated, signifying a crisis of unmatched magnitude in the captain's 42-year flying career. With the airplane's momentum faltering and rapidly descending over 1,000 feet per minute, the direness of their situation was palpable. Only 21.5 seconds after the bird strike, the plane was descending over the Bronx with Manhattan's northern edge visible. Recognizing that time was of the essence, the captain swiftly turned the plane, frantically searching for a landing spot. He experienced the haunting understanding that, unlike any other flight in his extensive career, this journey wouldn't conclude on an intact runway. Disaster averted. Amid a crisis in the skies, a snap decision had to be made. The Hudson River presented itself as a potential lifesaver, even with its inherent risks. Its vastness, both in length and width, and its relatively smooth surface that day, made it a feasible landing spot for an airliner. Upon realizing the dire nature of the situation, a mental shift occurred in Sullenberger's mind. He focused on a principle known as goal sacrificing. In situations where not all objectives can be met, it's crucial to prioritize and, if necessary, abandon lesser objectives in favor of more vital ones. Here, the decision to attempt a water landing meant forsaking the aircraft, valued at $60 million, in a bid to save human lives. Before the imminent landing on the water, a direct and composed announcement was made to the passengers. Brace for impact. As the descent continued, the surroundings, from the bluffs along the Hudson to the towering skyscrapers, drew closer. 
making it feel as though the plane was being embraced by the city itself. Despite the gravity of the situation, Sullenberger experienced a profound confidence in his ability to execute an emergency water landing, a confidence that eclipsed any encroaching fear. During this descent, without engine thrust, control was limited. The focus was on pitch, the angle at which the plane was tilted upward or downward. By optimizing the pitch, the goal was to maintain the appropriate glide speed. Using the natural pull of gravity, the plane continued its descent, with its wings cutting through the air to create lift. It had only been a short time since the initial bird strike that led to this emergency, but the water and earth below were fast approaching. A judgment call was made to flare the plane for landing. The rear of the aircraft experienced a jarring impact upon touchdown, while the front section felt more like a rough landing. The plane ultimately came to a stop on the river's surface, and the immediate aftermath was a testament to the precision and skill involved in the landing. The plane's nose was elevated at just the right angle, and the wings were level. Despite achieving these metrics, the descent rate was steeper than desired, but within minutes, the plane stabilized, presenting a panoramic view of New York's skyline. The subsequent evacuation was commendably swift. Despite challenges like the aft exit doors being rendered useless and water flooding the rear cabin, the last passenger was safely off the plane within a few minutes. A mix of boats, ferries, and helicopters played a crucial role in the rescue efforts. Reflecting on the ordeal, it was undeniably a day of intense challenges. Although the Airbus 320 couldn't be saved, the true victory lay in the fact that everyone aboard would be reunited with their loved ones. The ordeal stands as a testament to the power of quick thinking, prioritization, and skill under pressure. In this blink to Sully by Chelsea B. Sullenberger, you've learned about the extraordinary tale of Captain Sully Sullenberger who landed U.S. Airways Flight 1549 on the Hudson River, saving 155 lives. Sullenberger's actions that day reflected his dedication, hope, and preparedness, shaped by his life lessons, military service, and airline career. Amidst a world filled with uncertainties and challenges, his memoir underscores the enduring values worth upholding and the significance of being prepared for life's unpredictable moments. Okay, that's it for this blink. Thanks so much for listening. And if you can, please take the time to leave us a rating or a comment. We always appreciate your feedback. See you in the next blink.